is dedicated to Marquis Smith. And in homage to Marquis Smith, I'll begin with a Thursday night pop quiz question. Which of these two 1975 recordings are more deserving of the epithet ambient? Excuse me, I have a terrible throat today. Hence the water. A. Brian Eno's Discreet Music, released on the 1st of November 1975. Or B. Lou Reed's Metal Machine Music, released on the 1st of July 1975. It's not a true question. Two pieces of 20th century music that couldn't possibly be more different. The first went on to successful, successfully and lucratively spawn the genre of commercial ambient music that we all have come to know and love. And consequently, the epical recording music for airports, which we're all here today celebrating in one form or another. The second succeeded in damning its composer to years of critical vitriol and misunderstanding. The physical artifact itself, whether it was cassette, a track recorder, recording, or vinyl, was quickly consigned to uh, record store bargain bins, which is where I found my copy. And apart from being lauded by a few hip uh, aficionados, Lester Bangs, of course, it sank into cultural obscurity until resurrected for the pseudo-modernist stage by the German contemporary classical ensemble Zeitkratzer in 2002. In 1975, as a 13-year-old proto-punk rocker in uh, leafy London suburbia, I was exposed to a vast cornucopia of wonderful and life-shaping music. Excuse me. Thanks to the then erudite journalists at the NME Melody Maker, uh, liberal doses of John Peel, uh, Radio Luxembourg, and above all, the local library, and my extremely tolerant parents, um, I devoured as much organized sounds as my youthful brain could handle, from Pierre Schaeffer to Abba and almost everything in between. 1975 was a uh, particularly tumultuous year in terms of tragic world events. The sounds of rage, war, collapse, murder, social injustice, an absolute bloody mayhem screaming out of our TV sets and radios, enough to send on an almost daily basis an aggressively attired, yet overly sensitive teenage boy running for his nan's end of garden bomb shelter with a tattered edition of Wind in the Willows and that month's copy of Sniffing Glue tucked under his arm. In the balmy summer of that same year, during a lazy afternoon, rummaging through the bargain bins of Virgin Records basement shop in Oxford Street, I came across an already beaten up vinyl copy of Lou Reed's Metal Machine Music, the 25p. Immediately seduced by the image of a leather-clad alien Lou on the front cover, and already familiar with the Velvet Underground's Banana LP, I couldn't wait to get it back home and desecrate the peaceful sanctity of my mum and dad's garishly clad living room. Well, little did I realise that it scared me half to death, and at the same time it completely blew me away. More than any snot-nosed outburst of three-chord punk savagery, this music seemed to be an actual sonic reflection of the horrific events that surrounded me 24-7, from the grotesque obscenities of the Vietnam War to the shameful plight of tortured lab, lab animals, and on and on and on. Being a huge fan of Roxy Music and Brian Eno, I was already eagerly anticipating the release that autumn of discreet music on Eno's own obscure label. Uh, that he'd mentioned uh, a few times in various interviews. And to put it mildly, it, it did not disappoint. Here was my metaphorical bomb shelter, my perfumed palliative against a brutal world, my isolation, my heroin. However, blissful within my fake ambient womb, I sense rather than truly grasped that something was culturally out of joint, 
that some things just didn't add up, that somehow I had become disconnected. And in the words of the great film director Robert Brasson, it's not about understanding, it's about feeling. Ambient is an adjective, 1590s, surrounding and circling, from Latin ambientum. Surround is a verb. Early 15th century. The sense of to shut in on all sides, first recorded in the 1610s, influenced by figurative meaning in French of dominate. In the 1995 German documentary entitled Solo Farino, directed by Henning Lonner, Brian Eno speaks about composing music for Air Force as music to die to, subtly alluding to the artist as shaman healer dialogue earlier in the same documentary. It's fake, but it works. Music to alleviate the uncomfortable nearness of possible death, apropos passengers' general fear of flying, international terrorism, skyjacking and so on, which could indeed be interpreted as draping an exquisitely designed sonic veil over a heightened fear of mortality, especially if compared to Pierre Henri's masterful load to death Le Voyage. Apart from the rather sanctimonious, perhaps ironic, tone of Eno's, one only has to give the actual music a cursory listen to understand its relationship to the rarefied atmosphere of med medieval liturgical music, especially one slash two in its invocation of Gregorian chant, which lends the composition a particular, indeed illusory, essence of religious contemplation. Given Eno's predilection for sacred choral music, that comes as no surprise. And yet, it raises certain concerns in regards to his continued espousal of indeterminacy as methodology, the non-hierarchical role of the composer and the almost Marxist subjectivity of the listener. Firstly, in the usage of clearly defined loops of melodic phrases, a strict hermeticism is alluded to regarding the self-referential I, which immediately affords the work a powerful semblance of non-communalism, in that it is defined objectively as a completely closed, untouchable construct. One that appears to have no need of discourse whatsoever to be removed, to re sorry, to be received immediately within the consecrated space of self. From priest on high, Eno, to lowly disciple, ourselves. Secondly, Eno's Dixon, 1978, that ambient music is intended to produce calm and a place to think, indicates that very specific listening codes were designed by the composer and suggests elements of not so subtle listener coercion. This imposed sense of spirituality and musical sensuousness seems to suggest that despite all of the media talk at the time concerning Cajun principles of generative composition and the blurring of psychological and architectural spheres, music for air pause is in fact a deeply manipulative monocratic work, meaning one that confuses yet imperceptibly reinforces borders. By way of its gene splice transformation via New Age through to rave, ambient can be seen as a, a precursor to a kind of mass Occidental post-industrial narcosis, which, whilst acting as an introverted barricade against the super-aggressive manoeuvres of global cap capitalism, technocratic alienation and the horrors of an uncaring, unloving universe, emphasises the materialistic, egoistic self and the impossibility, in any real sense, of communication with our environment our fellow humans, or indeed the other species that coexist beside and besides us. Therefore, and solely for the purposes of this argument, ambient music and above all music for air force is classified as heretical and misanthropic in its complete disregard of real tragedy 
luxuriating in a fantastic glow of monomaniacal self-adoration and blasphemous self-glorification, a kind of religious megalomania that in composer and writer David Toot's words wants to shape and hold static an image of so-called beauty that excludes all that is inconvenient. On the other hand, whereas ambient music reinforces aggressive capitalism by refusing to challenge it in any way, in any compelling way, so-called cybernetic music, that which makes use of circular causal relationships, self-regulating mechanisms, and non-linear dynamics as indeterminate compositional tools, disintegrates all notion of object, institution, authority, and control, and instead allows a navigational freedom in order to arrive at the goal of conversation and communalism, as opposed to the soft tyranny of neoliberal economic stratagems, for example, a co-opting of the music underground and the locating of culture receptors happy to accommodate this takeover, leading to a state of lethargy, withdrawal and narcissism. Within this context of automatic or generative sonic design, Lou Reed's metal machine music can, can be identified as a mutable composition, one that seeks to annihilate borders rather than sanctifying them. And also, more pertinently for this argument, an ambient composition, according to the philosopher Tim Morton's usage of the word. Within Morton's definition of ambient, um, an undermining of that which Jacques Derrida calls the metaphysical distinction between inside and outside, music for airports, despite the artificial blurring of real and imagined space, could be classified as being conceptually and temporally rigid. Whilst using the same critical theorem, metal machine music could be classified as conceptually and temporally smeared, a constantly shifting fluid mass without edges or middle, in a continuous impressionistic haze of appearing and evaporating. According to music critic Massimo Ricci, this teleological approach towards a definition of ambient in relation to uh, cybernetic composition establishes a cathartic landscape, an, ar an articulate volatility dismantling the temporal coordinates of our perceptive development. This act of dismantling in reference to established borders, be they social, political, colonial, economic, etc., reveals an inherent desire to embrace an environment almost irrevocably damaged by cultivated greed, not, in the words of composer Robert Hampson, to retreat from it like ambient techno. And yet, in the very act of embracing our environment, we disappear from it. That is to say, in a moral universe, if man is perceived as being fundamentally criminal in its destructiveness, then to recognize and to consciously embody an unmoral universe, for example, one without enforced psychological borders, essentially means that man would become non-criminal and therefore non-human, ergo absent. Beauty and erasure, perhaps. No music for abandoned airports, a small excerpt which I'll, I'll play you in a second, is a reimagining of an ambient music that acts as a post-embodiment acoustic afterimage of the profane traces of human chaos channeled through the perfected art or holistic suspension in low theatre in which, paraphrasing the writer Tan Lin, people like paintings or poems are most beautiful and least egotistical at the precise moment they are, they are forgotten or disappear. It also considers the pre-embodiment paradox, the existential, existential panic, if you will, of mankind's theoretical acceptance of material instability, a non-hierarchical merging with the natural world, and consequently its inevitable yet harmonious dissolution as opposed to ambient as opiate, which implies the sustaining of a fearful culture 
via the nurturing of illusory domains and thus precipitating inharmonious dissolution. The choice, it seems, is ours, umbral vanishing or bloodthirsty annihilation. This composition, No Music for Abandoned Airports, uh, is defined within the parameters of Tim Morton's notion of empty urban spaces as sites of environmental suffering, in this case an abandoned airport. The human causation of such suffering, and in, in the strange loop, the human suffering engendered by being continuously surrounded by catastrophic world events and the inexorable raping of our own planet, which of course loops us back to that timid and precious 13-year-old boy at the beginning of this piece.